Good afternoon. Welcome to Google. I'm Mark Isakowitz. I'm Vice President of Government Affairs and Public Policy here at Google for the United States. Just started here about five weeks ago, and I run this Washington office. So again, welcome. Glad you're, glad you're here. Um, I want to uh, welcome you all here and uh, welcome today's speakers, who will be out in a minute, Ivanka Trump and Ramesh, Ramesh Panuru. Uh, Ivanka has been an incredibly strong advocate for job creation, workforce development, economic opportunity, and of course she knows what it takes to run a business. I have to say on a personal level, she's not here to hear it, but um, I, my last job I was Senator Rob Portman's chief of staff and I got to see up close how Ivanka makes a huge difference on the issues she cares about, including the ones we're going to discuss today. So. On a personal level, and uh, with my Google hat on, I'm uh, terribly uh, honored that she's here today. Um, at Google, we continue to support the White House's uh, workforce efforts, ranging from the Oak Ridge National Lab pilot to the Chamber Foundation job schema, all things I would encourage you to check out. And our work on our job search, our veterans' job search and pathways are in lockstep with the Council for the American Worker Advocacy Board, which, of course, Ivanka chairs. Uh, Ivanka has also been a driving force behind the Pledge to America's Workers, which, uh, incidentally, Google signed that pledge at a recent event uh, with Ivanka in Dallas. And we committed to getting Google's IT certificates into 100 uh, community colleges, uh, 250 250,000 new uh, training opportunities for American workers over the next five years through Grow with Google, which you may know is our initiative to create economic opportunity for all Americans. And then finally, today's topic, uh, paid family leave and child care, uh, we are trying to lead here at Google by example. In terms of our leave policies, uh, 22 weeks off uh, for new birth mothers, 12 weeks uh, for parental leave, 15 days of emergency backup child care and unlimited sick days. And we, we hope uh, others in the business community follow our success. You may know Susan Wojcicki, who is the CEO of YouTube and herself, a mother of five, has put a spotlight on these issues through op-eds, speeches, and calling for national reform. So given our common interest in these issues, we couldn't be happier uh, that this conversation is happening here at Google. So again, welcome, and it is my pleasure to welcome Lindsey Craig, uh, President of the National Review Institute. Okay. It's so exciting for us to be here um, at Google. Um, it's wonderful to be able to, to partner with you, Mark. Um, Max Pappas, uh, thank you so much for sticking with us for a really long time. We had this idea that we wanted to um, be able to host an event uh, on paid family leave, um, and we wanted to do it with sort of an intimate group uh, with you all here in Washington. You are all um, were invited for a reason. Uh, we like to, at National Review Institute, bring together a spectrum of people who might not agree on everything, but on this issue, you're really dedicated and you're interested in finding a solution. Um, and we think that that's really important. Um, Bill Buckley had a wonderful uh, ability to bring together people who um, didn't agree on everything, right? And um, you all have a lot of that here in Washington. I'm from New York, I'm conservative in New York, so that's an interesting uh, situation. But that's okay because the reality is is that we all work better when we come together and we find what we have in common ground. If we're working in common cause, we know that we can make a difference. And so I just wanna thank you all for coming and being able to participate with us here. Um, National Review Institute, as many of you know, um, but not all, it is the nonprofit that supports the National Review mission. So we have the capacity as the nonprofit to be able to hold events like this 
to bring people together um, to talk about big issues. Um, there's lots being written in the magazine. Um, Ramesh Panuru has written for a long time on paid family leave, but usually as it um, pertains to something that's happening in the news cycle. And so the Institute has the capacity to then be able to take that written product and maybe give it a wider audience. And that's what we're looking to do here today. So we look forward to keeping in touch with all of you. Um, we, continue, we will continue to um, highlight this issue because we think that it's very important. Um, so I'm going to turn the podium over to um, Catherine Lopez, who is also a fellow at National Review Institute, who can tell you a little bit about our work in this area. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm so grateful that we're all here today. Uh, along with life and liberty, the family is our treasure and our hope. It's important that we do all that we can to help families flourish. Sometimes when I think of what our priorities should be as a matter of public policy and well, in life in general, I actually think of an Iraqi family who had to flee ISIS terror, leaving their home in Mosul a number of years ago. The mom, speaking from a church basement where she and her family were now living in Erbil, was all about gratitude because she had her family, she had her faith. The church had stepped in to help them be safe and eventually figure out a new start. Her family and her faith were everything, and she knew it because she was stripped of everything else. Here in the United States, we have the protection of freedom. Sure, we have important and even contentious debates about freedom in the religious and speech context, but goodness, are we remarkably blessed. And yet, we also live at a time when it's no breaking news. There's a lot of anxiety about politics, and again, about life in general. Families are forced to make hard and even inhumane choices sometimes. They sometimes have to sacrifice the time that is critical for bonding when a new child is welcomed into their families. And then there's sickness and there's death. So many difficult issues we all have to face at some point in our lives in different ways. It's my hope and my prayer that an event like this one today, a collaboration between the National Review Institute and Google and the White House can help heal, help make progress, help highlight an issue where there's more meeting room for a whole lot of people from a whole lot of different political perspectives than not. I speak to you as someone who, like Ramesh Paniru, has been writing about the vulnerable, unborn, and women in need and families for two decades and counting. Ramesh has beat me by a couple of years at National Review. Ramesh has been a leader in the policy world talking about public policies that will promote family flourishing. He's made the arguments to conservatives in mainstream media and before Congress. He's the perfect person to be guiding our conversation today. And he's also himself a family man who knows the joys that we should be helping make possible for more people. I mentioned our pro-life credentials because I do firmly believe that paid family leave is part of what anyone who cares about vulnerable life and fragile families needs to consider supporting and promoting and fighting for. I think it's an area with a lot of opportunity for creative coalitions of people who don't necessarily agree on everything. And at a time when things have become so radical in some, some parts on abortion, what a beautiful place where we can stake out some urgent common ground. As the Center for Public Justice put it in a helpful report, Time to Flourish, Protecting Families' Time to Work and Care, enabling family time yields abundant benefits. When people are empowered to fulfill their caregiving responsibilities, all of society flourishes. Protecting and enabling family time at crucial moments, whether birth, adoption, illness, or death, is one essential way to uphold the enduring value of the family. As director of the Center for Religion, Culture, and Civil Society at the National Review Institute, I'm so grateful to be able to focus more exclusively on some of these under the radar issues sometimes that many of us theoretically or broadly agree on, like adoption and foster care and paid family leave. And I'm grateful for Ivanka Trump's heart for paid family leave as a help for families. Earlier this year, I was invited to a small meeting at the White House on paid family leave and was so impressed with her passion for the issue. She's obviously done a lot of studying and listening. So I welcome you all here. Thank you, and especially you, Ivanka Trump, for making the time to sit down with us here and our live stream audience today. We're all in this room and online. We may not all be on the exact same page on everything, but thank goodness we can sit down and have a substantive conversation about policy to help American families live and love and thrive. And with that, let the conversation begin, and thank you again um, in advance, Ivanka Trump and Ramesh Panir. Thank 
you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. Did you notice how she subtly pointed out that I'm older than her? <laughs> People think that Catherine is a sweetheart, but she's also very crafty. <laughs> Uh, and thank you to Google and the National Reunion Institute and the White House for making this possible. Thank you, Ivanka, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know, uh, I hear you've been very busy creating jobs. So, uh, True. so we, we very much appreciate that. Uh, I, want to talk by, I want to start by talking a little bit about the history yeah. of this. Um, because when your father campaigned in 2016, talking about paid family leave, he really broke new ground for a Republican presidential candidate. Um, this was something that no previous Republican presidential candidate had really done. And I want to know why. What, what was, why this interest? Why has this become a cause of yours? Well, thank you, and, and welcome, everyone. Um, it's exciting to be in, in this room full of thought leaders um, and, uh, and, and policy wonks who are helping us advance the goal of, of realizing um, paid family leave. Uh, the time has come. In fact, it's long overdue. So we appreciate your support as we push forward this initiative and, and really make a conservative argument for why paid family leave is important. But I do appreciate that question um, and um, the fact that it was so unusual for a Republican to be leading on this issue. And it wasn't even, he introduced it for the first time during the general election. He was talking about this during the Republican primaries. In the early primary space, um, uh, uh, spaced on the campaign trail. So this was an issue that he knew would resonate and was important to American working families um, and one that he really wanted to move the needle on and, and has done so uh, very successfully in following through, putting it in every budget he's ever introduced to so the first president. Republican or Democrat to call for a national plan in every single budget um, that he's ever introduced. He talked about it in the joint address in both states of the union. So he's really been advancing this narrative um, and advancing this policy at, um, at every major high profile opportunity. And I think part of the reason is him as a large employer um, when he was in the private sector recognized what the modern workplace needs and the competing demands of work and family for America's working parents. So this wasn't an intellectual argument for him. He was seeing this um, at his own businesses and, and in his own company. Many of the um, top leaders within um, his company at the time were women um, and were dealing with these same issues as, as well as men. So, so it, was, it was a priority for him and I think it should be a priority for us all. While this is not a woman's issue, it's a family issue, it does disproportionately impact women. So the lack of a paid family leave, particularly to those most vulnerable and those who need it the most and are therefore the least likely to receive it, um, falls on, on the shoulders of, of women. Today, one in four mothers go back to work within two weeks of having a child simply because they can't afford not to. Um, so it's, a, it's an enormous problem. And the reality is the nature of work has changed so radically in a relatively short period of time. When you think about the fact today that 40% of American households have women as the primary bread earner. That's a, that's a big change. 47% of the workforce is female. It's a big change. So what are the policies that can support working women and working families more generally? And, and I think that's why he chose to really get in front of it and has continued to try and move the ball. So where do you think this issue fits with the administration's overall economic agenda and record? Well, I think it's, it's part of the working family agenda more, more generally. So like I said, not specific to women, but definitely disproportionately impacting us. Another issue that um, is critical to, to that component of the president's economic agenda relates to high quality, affordable childcare. So if you look at a family's balance sheet and you break it down in 50% geographically of American households, the cost of childcare is the single largest family expense, even exceeding the cost of housing. So this is unsustainable in a world in which in 67% of homes, all parents work. 
So you need access to high quality care. You need to ensure that children starting in school at age five or six are at the same level as, as their peers that live in different zip codes um, and that parents are able to maintain their attachment to the workforce. The number of people I meet in my travels across the country who have had to leave their jobs because the cost of providing for daycare or childcare was getting to the point where outweighed what they were able to earn. So I think when we, when we look at economic growth, when we look at workforce attachment, um, when we look at quality of life issues, when we think about how critically important it is, because I view um, early childhood education and childcare, especially when you're talking about young children, as sort of one and the same, or at least it should be. Um, so really foundational issues as we think about preparing the next generation of American workers, our children, um, for, for the challenges ahead. These are, these are really critical issues, and we've done a lot on this front as well. So as part of tax reform, we doubled the child tax credit. Um, we expanded refundability. This is a big deal for American parents. We also increased um, pretty dramatically the number of people who are eligible for the child tax credit. So now it is $2,000 a child, um, which is very, very meaningful relief to, to working families, as we know the, the large cost of, of raising a child um, in, in today's environment. I think. Um, when you look at some of the more effective programs that exist today um, and vehicles for delivering relief in terms of child care affordability to those who need it. Um, to working parents, it's the child care and development block grants. This administration led the largest increase, we fought for and secured the largest increase in the history of that program. So really, we really are, our budget's following what, um, what we have um, stated as priorities, we're advocating for it and, and securing the funds um, as part of our dis discussions with, with lawmakers on the Hill. Um, and, and we're really getting it done. One, one other element I'll go back to because I, I mentioned um, tax reform um, is, uh, is the fact that as part of tax reform, the first ever national paid family leave tax credit was passed. This was spearheaded by Senator Fisher. Um, and it's intended to incentivize employers to offer paid leave to employees least likely to receive it, um, those making under $75,000 a year. So we see the drop off. If you are making under $75,000 a year, there's around a 6% chance you receive any form of paid leave. If you're making over $150,000, it increases exponentially. So um, her uh, proposal, which was passed as part of tax reform, is a way to incentivize the private sector to, to step up. Um, and, and we're seeing that happen across the country, but, but there's still very much a need. So you talked about priorities, and you've mentioned a bunch of different goals that uh, family leave in particular serves. And I just wonder what you think in terms of the trade-offs of them. Because it's possible that you have a policy that ends up giving families more time together, but maybe doesn't increase participation in the workforce over the long run. So apparently that's what's happened in California. I'm sure you've seen that study. Yeah. What, what do you think of as the sort of the, the main goal as opposed to the secondary goal here? Okay, I think as Republicans, we are staunch advocates of work and family. Mm -hmm. And they go together. You can't view them in, in isolation. So, so yes, there is a real workforce attachment issue. Having a child should not sever your attachment to a job or, or to the workforce. Um, and, and then, of course, there's the family values. We, we know the health benefits of, uh, for a child and for a parent mm -hmm. of, of having that time um, to bond and, and to, to recover. Um, following a critically important life event. But you mentioned trade-offs, and you know there are others as well. We have the lowest fertility rate in the history of our country. So what's the cost of that when we have less people shoring up our existing um, entitlement programs and, and programs? So, so the cost of the plummeting fertility rate, the cost from a health perspective of children not getting the care that they need, we actually have the highest rate of sudden infant death syndrome in the developed world. Because if you're that one in four mom who's returning to work 
within two weeks of having a baby, most institutional care centers won't take a child until they're between six and 12 weeks of age. And if you're not fortunate enough to have a spouse or a family member who can assist you um, and can't afford one-on-one um, -on -one care, you're left with very few options um, and often unsafe options, uh, a neighbor down the hall who may not be equipped or prepared um, to handle the needs of an infant. So there's trade-offs for everything. What's exciting to me is this is a moment in time where new ideas are percolating. So these issues should be debated. But for the first time in the history of the paid family leave discussion, we're getting to a place with legislators where it's not should paid family leave be a policy priority, but what's the best design for a paid family leave program? And that was not true when we arrived here two and a half years ago. There was very little bipartisan support. There was one plan that had been proposed and reproposed and reproposed um, for many years. And without even faulting the plan, there had never been bipartisan support for it. Um, and not even every Democrat had supported it, nor had it been scored. So really, it was a messaging document. And so we really wanted to catalyze, OK, so that is one path. What are other paths that may generate the type of bipartisan interest that will be required for us actually to be able to deliver for families who need this relief? And we've seen bills from Rubio and from Mike Lee and Joni Ernst um, with new, fresh ideas. Uh, Senator Cassidy and Senator, uh, Senator Sinema have proposed the first ever bipartisan proposal um, to provide leave for working parents. So it's, it's, it's quite exciting to see the traction we're getting on, on bringing new policies to the forefront to be um, debated um, and for coalitions to be built around, uh, around advancing those ideas. So there seems to be one of the principal dividing lines among all these different approaches now is the financing. So do you do a tax Name increase? Name a policy issue right. where that is not the yes, case. Yes, right. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, that always, is, it's easy until you have to How are you going to pay for it? Right. I mean, that's, that's true. That, look, that's true of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and um, different plans will, will cost different amounts. You know, the Family Act has not been scored. So we don't really know um, how much that, that will cost. Um, the uh, Cassidy Cinema Plan is uh, budget neutral because you're pulling forward a credit. Um, interestingly, because of the fact that as part of tax reform, we doubled the child tax credit, even pulling it forward and then paying it back over a 10-year period of time, you're still, even pulling forward the maximum amount, you're still getting a larger distribution of the child tax credit than you would have in 2017 prior to tax cuts having taken place. Right. So it's still a, a larger benefit than prior to this administration starting, even if you, you front load the benefit. Um, you have the, uh, the Rubio, Romney, and then um, Mike Lee Ernst um, approach slightly different, but, but variations of the same idea relating to Social Security um, and and the ability to utilize that as as um, a vehicle, so not a not create a new entitlement program, but create more flexibility around an existing one, um, based on an individual's determined priorities. So it's it's I think it's a great time, and it's a great time to have all of you here um, thinking about uh, this issue and and engaging and providing feedback and um, and there's real momentum. So you've catalyzed this debate. There are a bunch of different, some creative new ideas out there. What needs to happen next to get this, get us closer to actually getting it done? We need to maintain the momentum that the conversation has. You know, unfortunately, it's been 25 years since FMLA was passed, and we're still at zero weeks of paid leave. And to be honest, there wasn't a whole lot of urgency. Um, so while this is urgent for families across the country, there's not a lot of urgency on the Hill to get it done. Um, and truthfully, the debate had grown a bit stale. So we're looking to seize the momentum right now where there are new ideas to see if we can energize um, 
uh, those proposals. And look, uh, you know, a lot of, like I said, the fact that three different legislative options have been proposed by Senate Republicans, and in one case, um, a Republican and, and a Democrat, in the past four months, maybe six months, that's, that's pretty good, um, considering, uh, considering the various policy issues that are, are constantly being debated. So, so I'm quite optimistic that if we can contain, maintain this level of interest and, um, and keep the dialogue going, that uh, we'll arrive at, at the outcome we all want, which is thoughtful legislation um, that, that ultimately is passed and, and signed by the president that delivers on the goal of supporting America's hardworking families. So at the moment, do you see, do you foresee the administration picking one of these approaches or more just being an honest broker and, and fostering the conversation? So I spent um, around a year and a half meeting with members on both sides of the aisle in the House and the Senate just talking about paid leave. In a lot of those discussions, it was educating lawmakers on why paid family leave can align beautifully with conservative values and why it's good conservative policy. And that was foundational work. Truthfully, I was not expecting to need to do. So that was a little bit of a surprise to me how the argument really hadn't been brought across the aisle um, and how Republicans really hadn't been engaged with on, on this issue. Um, so, so the first couple of years was really about having those discussions and, um, and, and working with different organizations and, and, and advocacy groups and, and, and lawmakers and, and just talking about why paid leave is, is so important um, and building those coalitions of support. I think what we've seen in the last six to eight months is a shift to those coalitions now moving the needle um, in terms of generating the policy ideas. Senator Cassidy was amazing. Um, you know, he is a doctor. He very much understood sort of the medical necessity, um, the, uh, the relevance to, to, a, to an infant, to a child, and, and of course to a parent as well, um, and committed to holding um, a hearing on this issue uh, around 12 months ago and now has been one of the great champions of, of advancing the ball. So, so look, everything we're doing is just foundational work. Um, you know, every meeting, every conversation um, where, where we get more and more people aligned with the fact that this is policy that's necessary in the modern economy to support the modern family. So, so I, I, I can't give you a time frame to be mm -hmm. honest. Um, you asked if we're supporting any one proposal. What we've been trying to do is support the introduction of several ideas um, and then work to build coalitions of support for them and see which has the type of interest that it will be able to garner the votes to be passed. Like that's, for me, that's what I care about the most, a well-designed, thoughtful policy that addresses the issues. Um, and you need support and momentum to, to do that. So we've sort of intentionally been trying to cultivate interest and ideas and build, build that momentum um, without sort of affirmatively pushing any one policy just yet. And, and several of these policies are also not mutually exclusive. Mm. You look at what Cinema and Cassidy are proposing, that doesn't close the door to what Rubio is proposing. They're different concepts. Um, or to even the Family Act. They're, they're different ideas um, that, uh, that um, don't close the door on one another. So are there any red lines for the administration, like raising taxes, for example? Raising taxes, there, there will be no interest in doing that. And there will be any, there's no viable path forward. I think a mandate on, um, on business, particularly small business, is, is very difficult. Um, the administration views flexibility as important um, and that one size fits all scenarios tend not to be the best way um, to, uh, to create policy. So uh, we have definitely parameters, um, but when you say red lines, I wouldn't say sort of strict red lines beyond um, what I just referenced. Um, I took you to be alluding, correct me if I'm wrong, earlier to the current of conservative opinion that says this is just, this is not the federal government's business. 
federal government should not be involved in this. Private sector is getting better and better at delivering family leave. Uh, it sounds like you've had some of those conversations. What do you say in response to that? Well, if you look at the correlation between people who don't have access to paid leave and the likelihood to go on public assistance within the year following the birth of a child, or conversely, those who have access to paid leave are 40% less likely to go on public assistance after, after the birth of a child. I think it very much is, um, is there's, there's a cause and there's a consequence. And, um, and, and I think that our job um, at a federal level has to be recognizing the realities of, um, of what it means to be an American today. And being an American today means that you're likely um, to be part of um, a household where two or all parents are working. Um, and we need to support that next generation and, and ensure that they're adequately provided for, whether it's high quality childcare, whether it's paid leave, so they get that, that time and attention they, um, they very much need. So no, I, I view this as a very important policy from, from a federal perspective. That doesn't mean it has to crowd out private sector solutions. But it's been a long time. Again, I mentioned 25 years since FMLA was passed, and still only 13% of all employees receive any form of paid leave. And most of those are the people who can afford, I hate to say can afford not to receive it, but they're the ones who are in the best financial situation, um, not those who are the most vulnerable. Today, the single greatest predictor, the single greatest determinant of bankruptcy is motherhood. And that's not acceptable. So um, are you finding that some of that conservative resistance has declined or softened? I have. Since you've been starting? And I think it's because of the pre president's leadership on this right. issue. He's brought to the forefront an issue that um, was not part of the traditional Republican conservative platform and created a very strong argument for why this is good and timely policy. So over on the other side, on the Democratic side, uh, with the exception of Senator Sinema, are you finding a lot of receptivity, a lot of interest in, in talking about compromise, or is it much more, we, we've got the Family Act, that's what we're doing, and, and we're not working with you people anyway? There has been, there has been definitely more interest in coalescing around the Family Act. I think the challenge with that is there are a lot of Democrats who still haven't signed on to the Family Act, and there are no Republicans who are interested in it. Mm -hmm. So we have to break up that logjam um, with, with a different idea. Um, and there is some resistance to doing that. Um, because it's easy to have sort of signed on to that. But I, I just, I, I don't today see a path forward on that plan. Um, but like I was saying before, the other ideas that we're talking about, that we're advancing, don't preclude ultimately the Family Act if um, the sponsors are able to garner the support to pass it into law. But at some point, you do have to start to pivot to other solutions. And, and we're starting to see Democrats be more open-minded to alternative approaches. There are a lot of Democrats who don't believe in payroll tax increases mm -hmm. and think that it disproportionately and ad most adversely affects um, the poorest and most vulnerable working Americans. Um, so they aren't supportive of, of the pay fors um, that are, are part of, of the Family Act. So we, we are now starting to see that discussion happen, but you have to be putting forth ideas first. And, and that's been what Republicans have been doing over, over the course of the last six months, actual policy ideas that can be debated and discussed. You may have noticed that we're in a bit of a contentious political moment. No. And uh, <laughs> Kath I've actually never known no, anything yeah. else. <laughs> Catherine was talking about this set of issues related to children as being yeah. something that can help bridge the divide. Yeah. But it seems to me that it's at least as likely that it works the other way around and the partisan division makes it impossible to make progress uh, even here. 
and you know, not too far from here, of course, impeachment proceedings are going on. That I would think that's got to make it less likely that something happens here. Is that your assessment as well? Well, look, there's administrative action that can be taken and is being taken in terms of how we prioritize in our budget the um, priorities that we fight for on the Hill um, as, as part of that budget process, and also the actions that we're able to take um, at our discretion. Right now, HHS is concluding um, a really robust uh, countrywide listening session to talk to educators, um, lawmakers, state and local officials, parents, um, educators about the challenges of accessing quality care um, and, and early childhood education. So there's, there's a lot we can and are doing. I mentioned the fact that we took the child care and development block grants. That's money that's given to governors to help offset the cost of child care for those who cannot afford it, those working um, American families. And we took that from 3.8 billion to 5.2 billion, um, the largest increase in the program's history. So we are fighting and we are making a difference. We passed on a partisan basis um, tax cuts and reforms, which have led to this incredible and unprecedented economic boom that um, this country is experiencing and enjoying. And as part of that, um, despite the fact that doubling the child tax credit would normally be something Democrats would be supportive of, despite that all Republicans um, pass that and, and it was signed into law. So there are things we're able to get done, but, but look, I've, I've worked really well with um, members on, on both sides of the aisle. So whether it's Perkins reauthorization after a decade of just sort of hanging out there, whether it's human trafficking um, legislation that we've been able to move the needle on um, in, in a very meaningful way in, in recent years. There's a lot of good work that is happening, can happen. I do think we have an opportunity for some really substantive action. Um, on, on higher education um, reforms, and uh, Lamar Alexander has been a great champion on that, drug pricing. So, so let's see, but the way I view it is you have to be an optimist. It's too easy to say that things can't get done, so you have to keep chipping away, and um, you have to keep engaging, and you have to keep advancing the ball, and, and we're doing that whether we do it alone um, and, and move the ball administratively or, or whether we're able to do it um, legislatively in, in the year to come. So we had asked uh, for people to submit questions. And one of the questions we got over the internet was about um, state level efforts yeah. to uh, make family leave more possible for people. Uh, and uh, someone who identified him or herself as a member of the Colorado State Task Force on this issue was wondering sort of how the federal and state level efforts would sort of mesh together. Yeah, so, well, I mean, I'm a huge believer that states are the laboratories of innovation and, and there's much to be learned from what's being done on a state and local level. Um, and we're constantly gathering that information. So um, just by way of an example, next month at the White House, we will be hosting a summit dedicated to this issue dedicated to child care access and affordability, um, early childhood education, and, and paid family leave. Um, and we will be convening leaders from across the country, whether they be lawmakers um, or governors um, or private sector um, innovators who are proposing new solutions or, or businesses. There's tremendous um, new opportunity um, and, and great innovation happening in, in the private sector as well. So um, we're going to be um, we're going to be bringing uh, those folks together. So I think there is a lot of there is a lot of great work being done. There are a lot of great ideas. I actually um, uh, an amazing woman who just joined us who's now running the Women's Bureau. I met on the road through Governor Bryant. So you meet incredible talent across the nation and um, and then encourage them to come to Washington and uh, and help us um, move the ball from, from a national perspective. But, but I think the input and also the data we are able to collect uh, in terms of what's happening on a state level is, is very relevant and, and very important. And, and most often, states are the ones who lead. 
I think some of the challenge will be for employers that are in multiple states and what the inconsistency of different policies will mean from a practical level. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that's not, that's not unique to this per particular policy proposal. I think that's true just in general. Um, all states have, have different rules, regulations, and, um, and that's you know, a labyrinth that um, companies right. need to learn to navigate. So I can't believe that we're, we're already coming toward the end of this, um, this great discussion, but I, I wanted to get one last question in, which is also from um, our uh, contributors, which was about the international experience with these issues. And the person who emailed was actually asking about whether we shouldn't be setting our sights higher because so many European countries have much, much more generous leave policies. But I wanted to ask also, can we learn something about the drawbacks of various childcare and leave policies? Because it does seem that some of these countries, it's actually harder for women to advance in careers at, in part because of some of these policies. Well, so it's, it's it's a it's an excellent point, and so I think we are the beneficiaries of the fact that there is more data, um, that we have more case studies, and look, every country and every market's unique. Um, uh, there's no sort of prescriptive solution that we can um, mirror to a T with with the same outcome um, and result, no matter how well designed. But but I do think you're right. We've also learned that there are policies that are showing that they're actually negatively impacting. Um, women. Look, if you're out of the workforce, in some cases, countries allow you to be out of the workforce for three years. If you have multiple children, that's many years outside of the workforce. It's very hard to maintain the trajectory you would have otherwise been on. So there is, and, and look, that's for an individual to decide. Um, but but there, is, um, there is a growing body of research that shows where a certain amount of leave is is so long that it creates the adverse consequence in terms of the outcome for um, the individual that's taking it. And while I, I just want to say we spent a lot of time talking um, about, about women and um, these issues do disproportionately impact us, it is amazing to see um, the enthusiasm around paternity leave as well. Um, I, there's a big energy and, and, and support um, around, around that concept as well. And look, as, as women across the world um, and, and here at home, we provide the vast majority of unpaid care, not only to children, but to adult dependents. Actually, as part of tax reform, we passed um, a brand new dependent care credit to help offset the cost of dependent care um, for an adult dependent, someone over, over the age of 17, whether that be um, a child in school who's still living with the family or, or um, a, an aging relative. Um, so I do think the more we talk about the needs of a family, whether it's caring for our children or, or adult dependents as, as a family issue, not a woman's issue, and, and encourage men to um, take that leave um, and, and participate um, in, um, in doing so, I think the better for us all. So um, I think I have time for actually a little bit more because you were, you were pithy. Uh, and um, I'm just wondering what your views are on the scope of um, the kind of leave policies we ought to be promoting or encouraging. Do we need to um, restrict it really to, to the priority of time with newborns? Or should it include, as some people argue, um, time off to take care of, uh, of, of sick relatives? Or is it just a matter of, well, let's just find something that can pass? Well, I believe it should be the latter, and it should mm -hmm. include um, care for, um, for, for sick relatives. With that said, there is the most support and energy around parental leave. Um, and I do think that's the policy with the greatest likelihood mm -hmm. of advancing in, in the short term. Um, it's binary, right? You either have a child or adopt a child or, or you don't, so it's much easier to track and to measure um, than, uh, than uh, care for, for a sick relative. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think they're both incredibly important um, and, and are policies that we should be debating. So I've, uh, I've gotten the cue card equivalent of a hook here. So um, I want to just 
end by saying thank you for engaging on this issue and joining us today to share your thoughts on it. Thank you, and thanks Please for Please join me in the forum and applauding. applauding.